Welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. I'm Josh Spector, and I am your host. If you don't know who I am, I'm the creator of the For the Interested newsletter, which you can check out at fortheinterested.com. If you're new here, this podcast exists to help creative entrepreneurs get their question answered. Here's how it typically works. In each episode, a different guest comes on, asks me three questions. We have about a 10-minute conversation about each of them, and hopefully I share some wisdom. But today is going to be a special episode because we are going to flip the script. And instead of someone coming on asking me questions, I brought on a special guest whose expertise I want to learn for him. And I am going to ask her three questions. Today's guest is Beth Lapidus. Beth is the creator, host, and producer of the legendary Uncabaret, the show that literally launched the alt comedy movement. She's also the author of the critically acclaimed and groundbreaking audiobooks, So You Need to Decide. And her infinite creator workshops and coaching programs are hotbed of creative breakthroughs. You might have seen her on Comedy Central or Sex in the City, and she knows and has shared a stage with probably every comedian you've ever heard of and admire. I don't know if Beth knows this or not. I've known Beth for a few years, but literally decades before that, uh, I was a huge comedy fan, and I had somehow found an Uncabaret CD that I had bought. And it was so funny when I when we did first come across each other, I was like, oh my God, like this is the woman behind the thing with all the comics that that I love. So Beth, it is good to see you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Josh. It's so great to be here. I'm just, I'm just so thrilled to be here with for the, you, I'm a huge fan of yours. Yeah, thank you. I am so excited to have you here, not only because I want to pick your brain about a few questions that I have for you, but also for anyone that's tuning in, while you've done a ton in the comedy world, we're going to talk about stuff that goes way beyond comedy and you really help writers and performers and actors and really sort of have honed in on how to help anyone with creative work and get what's in them out of them in a way that people want to hear. That is really the thing. It's in people come to me and they're like, I don't know. It's like in here. Basically it's in here. How do I get it out? Yeah. And yeah. Even and practiced at it. When you get to the really big thing, sometimes it's really hard to do the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And all those things that prevent people from getting it out, all the fears and all the confusion oh, yeah. and all, all the everything. So yeah. that's the, the creativity whisperer, I guess. So let's start here. So the first thing I want to know is creative people usually have a million things they want to create, but obviously and unfortunately, we can't do it all. So let's start with how do you recommend people choose what to work on and where to invest their time and what is just sort of a random idea they have versus a thing that they really need to, to bring to life? That is such a great question, Josh. Well, first of all, there are two questions that I always recommend people ask when they're trying to decide about their next project. Why me? Why now? Why me? Why now? You can ask those two questions over and over and over again for the rest of your life. Why me? Not in that whiny way. Like, why me? Right. Why, me? Right. <laughs> right. why, why, why not you? But the why me of like, basically, there are, you have limited time. You should really be working on the projects that are specifically, you know, whether you believe in it in a spiritual way or just an efficiency way you're meant to do, you know, that you're best for, that no one else can do that aren't random. All these are all ways to describe why me. And that might be everything from what medium. Sometimes people are just still figuring out, do I want to write a script? Do I want to do stand-up? Do I want to do storytelling? Do I want to do a memoir? Should it be a memoir or a one-person show? Should, you know, so part of me, you know, looking at why me is being very self-aware of who you are. So that's a deep dive. That's a lifelong process. That seems easy. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> reason it's good to work with somebody i know you work with people also it, i've had it described as like you know you're inside a jar and you can't see the label and somebody else is on the outside you're so close to the label your nose is right on the label but it's the wrong side it just takes you know yeah. so there's that and somebody asking you the questions and pushing you to do the work it has to do with knowing your own temperament of knowing your you know of your skills of your you know let's call them weaknesses but you know People sometimes overlook their greatest assets. You know, you're just easy and good with people. And you're, yet you've decided to work alone on a novel that will take 12 years. 
you know, that's probably not a great choice. For you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You can drive yourself crazy. On the other hand, there are, you know, people who have no sense of structure and are great with dialogue. And either, you know, you have to decide to get good with dialogue, I mean, with structure, or then get a partner or do something that does require structure. So why me has so many different elements. Why me could also be, I know you just had a baby recently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Know, you Time is probably different than it was before you have, you know, infant time is different than other times. So you want to pick projects to do that have to do with why me, which brings us to why now, you know, looking at the moment that you're in in your own life. And even bigger than that, looking at the moment that we're in collectively, how is this project going to land out in the world? Is there an audience for it? Is there a hunger for it? Is it is it in line with something that's happening in the world currently where people think, oh, you know, they're, you're you're competing with so many things when you're trying mm -hmm. to, is how is it going to break? And this is different than second guessing. I really don't want to do, well, will anyone buy it? How will I know people buy right. it? Well, you don't never know. But you can find energy and finding energy is part of why now. Also, why me is a, is a little bit commercial because, you know, when you're going to sell a project, as I'm sure you know, people who are buyers, whether they're TV networks or even just readers who are going to buy a book, want to know, like, why you? Like, why am I buying yeah. this project from you if it's a TV show? You know, are there 20 million more episodes? Even subscribing to your newsletter. I mean, I know why you, because you are interested. It's for the interest, because you're mm -hmm. interested. And I, if I subscribe, I know every single day, Josh is going to send me something I'm interested in. And, and it's not somebody, it's you. Mm -hmm. So why me, why now, over and over again? I love that. Let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions on each one of those. So. For the why me question, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening that, and I think this is so common. I hear so many people talk to me about imposter syndrome. It's funny. If I ever reference imposter syndrome, it's like, there's going to be a million clicks on me, right? <laughs> so every, everybody, everybody has it. But I think for those people that are, that I think really struggle with the why me questions, they go, well, there's nothing, there's nothing special about me. I don't have any, you know, credibility or experience or whatever or I don't feel like I'm good enough or any of that. Like, what do you say to those people that genuinely, which by the way, I don't think this is remotely true. I think everybody has, you know, has stuff that's interesting about them. But I think there's a lot of people that genuinely feel like there's nothing, there is no reason why they, what do you say to those people? Great question. Know yourself better, get more interesting. It's actually, you could get, you know, sometimes when people don't have something to write about and are blocked, I kind of look around at their life and I say, you need to live more. You honestly mm -hmm. live more, but say that isn't true. Say you were, mm -hmm. say that isn't the case. Uh, sometimes it really does help to talk to someone else. I mean, there is only a certain amount that you can self-diagnose mm -hmm. why there are coaches. That's why you have best friends. That's why you have, you know, mentors. It's why you have community. And I think especially writer types and, you know, people, sometimes you get in a little bubble and you can't see yourself. So mm -hmm. this is a great time to connect connection is a super important part of it and it may be such a small thing that's why you that you might you you know why me i've got nothing i have this all the time and then yes. suddenly you're talking to them and they're like you know i have the you know why me oh sorry i have to go because my screwdriver collection person you know it's what oh well you know it's just this screwdriver collection i don't know why i came up with that example but you know it's like some weird little niche that you know that what what what's here about that? So I think I think also sometimes paying along those lines, paying attention to what questions people ask you, what they oh. want to know your opinion on. Like yeah. there's something to your point, right? There's something that other people are asking you about, curious about that you haven't really picked up on, but that it's a sign. If you know, I always say if one person's interested in it. Lots of people are interested in it yeah. and it's a sort of shortcut to content creation. Like any question someone asks you, they're probably not the only one that has that, has that question. I mean, that's a great point. And, and, you know, love the question is a great way to find your way in. I mean, people are asking you questions, love that question and love your own curiosity in a way, you know, 
creativity, the word, people think it means to make something, but it actually means to grow. It comes from a word meaning to grow. And so if you're looking at what you're going to create, you know, what are the things that, that you're actually curious about that are going to make you grow? What are people curious about you and what are you curious enough about that you're going to be able to do it on the days you don't want to? Yeah, I love that. I love that point also. And, and your sort of take on the, the curiosity piece, because it separates the outcome from it. If you're just pursuing the curiosity, you don't have to like, you don't have to get hung up on, is this going to work? Right. Yep. Like it works if you're curious and you learn more or spend time doing it or whatever. That means it's quote unquote work. And I think that's a lot of times where people block themselves is they go, yeah, I'm curious about this thing, but I don't think anyone else is or no one's going to care or that that's kind of the second guessing thing. You know, yeah. the passion is so important that curious, what passion, curiosity, because also in the course of your creative life, you are going to make stuff that nobody wants. I mean, it happens to right. the most successful people make stuff that, and the script is sitting in the drawer uh, or you made the pilot and it didn't go. It always happens. But if you were truly curious about it, you learned about it and it led you to the next thing. Robert Altman, when he got his Lifetime Oscar, the, in, in his speech, he said the greatest thing. He said, you know, it's all one movie. It's all mm -hmm. one movie. And that is one way to start seeing it so that you don't feel like this particular project failed or succeeded, but the whole thing to start to see the arc of your career or your creative life, you know, like that. I love that. That Robert Altman story is probably going to wind up in my newsletter. So that, <laughs> th thank you. Thank you for that. I'm very excited about that. Great. So let's, so that was awesome. Let's go to my second question for you. The next thing I want to know is you have worked with and collaborated with so many incredibly talented artists, comedians, creatives. Uh, I am sure besides helping and teaching them, you have learned a ton from them. So what are the three most valuable lessons you've learned from them over the years and who taught you them? Okay. Well, Michael Patrick King, the writer, director, creator of Sex and the City and The Comeback, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, he once just said to me, years ago, follow the green lights. It's so simple. Um, mm -hmm. And I use it over and over and over again. And what does that, that is, that can mean a green light, sure, from a network, but it can also mean the green light of your own curiosity. It can mean the green, you know, I love, I love mystery and magic and all that stuff and mm -hmm. synchronicities and you're starting to work on something and then you see the word everywhere you go. And I mean, yep. pe you know, people discount that kind of stuff. And that is, you're an artist or creator, at least, even if you're, you know, you're a creative business person, you're in the world of creativity and you want to remember that you're co- I hope this isn't too woo woo, but you're co-creating this with mm -hmm. the force of creativity. You are part of the creative web of the whole world. So if you start to see where the green lights are coming in and really look for the green lights rather than look for the stop signs. Cool. That how do you how do you look for a green light and what's an example of sort of green lights you've seen that have influenced you in in your work? Oh wow. Well, or maybe look for them is the wrong word, but how yeah. do you become aware yeah. so that when you see one, you don't miss it? Disregard it. Yeah. Right. I mean, suddenly people are like, you know, say you're really starting out and suddenly people are liking a particular post that, you know, you've said something, well, it's a, just the algorithm or, you know, well, no, maybe mm -hmm. people are actually interested in that thing that's different than your other things. It's a little bit staying out of ego. And doing what you think you want to do rather than what you're hearing, you know, rather than being in conversation. I've gotten actually literally signs that are signs. Like literally I've seen like there was, so this is a crazy sign, but there at that one point I was, I decided to move. I needed to move. And there were some work parts of that, but I had to move away from my yoga studio in order to do what I wanted to do. And I was really reticent to move that far. And I kept like being like, ah, about it. And the day I was moving, I was 
driving away and crying. <laughs> and I had to pull over and I gave myself a talking to because I am not a good enough driver to drive while crying. And I was like, look, you flowed in yoga. Now you're flowing in life. Your yoga's in your life. Just flow in life. Just you're a, you are a flow. You're a flower. You're a flower. That's what you are. You know, just be <laughs> that. Don't have to go to yoga. And I'm not kidding you. I stopped crying and I looked up and I was on Flower Street. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So sometimes it's like that. Yeah. And sometimes you have to seek it out. Like you have to start to send stuff out sometimes. I mean, it's yeah. hard to get the green lights while it's all just sitting in your head or on the desk. So sometimes. Seek well, it's like, I love what you said, the example of a, <clears throat> of a post and I, you know, this, this social media post is a good example, but it could be anything, right? The, you know, paying attention to, and I think asking yourself, why did that resonate? Versus yeah. like, oh, people, people like that post and they didn't really like that other post and whatever. I'll just go on to the next post, but taking that moment to sort of go, well, what was it about that? And it's funny, as you were talking about that, I remember when I went to, I think the Uncabaret anniversary show and you, you had a bunch of t-shirts and stuff you were selling, but one of them was, it just said, maybe this is perfect. Yes. And I think we had talked, I know my wife bought one and we had talked afterwards and you said, I think if I'm remembering this right, that that shirt sold like crazy. Right? Yeah. yeah that's big and it tipped you off that like, wow, there's something in that concept. There's something about that phrase that clearly resonated with people. And I think it's an example, whereas a lot of people would just go, oh, that was a popular shirt. They wouldn't <laughs> take that extra step to think about what does it mean that the concept, maybe this is perfect resonated so much with an audience, just like I had said previously that I know imposter syndrome resonates with my audience because I've paid attention and seen a lot of people use that phrase. A lot of people click links about that. Like it's, it's, you know, that kind of thing to at least recognize there is a green light there in some capacity. Yeah. I would even just say for what, just to take that phrase, maybe this is perfect for Uncabaret, which is about, you know, new material and putting things out, you know, it had to do with making mistakes, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so it was very on brand, but in life yeah. in general, you know, it, it's, it's a big life idea, which is what people come to me yeah. about, you know, big life cool. ideas. Yeah. So that was Michael Patrick King. So that's the first, first lesson you've learned. Yes. What's the next, what's the next one? Well, I'm going to say Meryl Marco, the genius writer, Meryl Marco in the book. So you need to decide. Well, I, I interviewed people. We had conversations really about their life decisions, but also about big ideas in decision-making. And she brought up the idea that she really believes in sleeping on it and sleeping on it as an actual tactic. And we all get so fraught. And since then, I just sometimes really am able to say, as I'm fretting about it late in the day, you know, this is a good one to sleep about, you know, mm -hmm. literally, and things do appear the next day. It's, I mean, there's so many yeah. other reasons saying that, hand it over, you know, let go. For right. some reason, very, you know, I'm a very make it happen person, which mm -hmm. is a nice way of saying clingy, controlling. <laughs> <laughs> right. And sometimes it's hard to let go. Which, yeah. And even know, just stepping away, stepping away from drafts of work or, yeah. you know, whatever. It's amazing how different it all is when you come back to it. And if you have a lot going on also, sometimes you're like, I don't want to have to come back to this. I want to finish it, you know, I mm -hmm. finish it. and, and sleeping on it was just, it was been super helpful. I mean, huh. for me. Yeah. It's a good uh, one. What's the third one? Byron Bowers, who has started performing with us now five or six years ago, very on fire comedian. He's new. Anyway, in the book also, he talks about something that I think I had maybe not articulated for myself or thought about recently, which is making the decision to let go of old dreams. Mm. And I think that's so important in creative work. I've talked about this a lot lately and really it's resonating for people. I think we have the dreams of our younger selves within us, but we change and our dreams change. And it's very important to do a periodic inventory and look to see if you are trying to make your old dreams come true. Mm -hmm. Is it still your dream? Do you still want to be a stand-up comedian? Is that, do you really want to go on the road now? Is that what you really want to do? Do you still really want to write a novel or do you still now have more to do with, you know, 
you're with reality and you don't want to make things up anymore. I mean, there's so many ways, you know, yeah. this question. How do you, how do you think someone goes about, I love that. And I think it's, I think it's really smart. And I also think it's actually closely related to, I think there's the sort of, do you still want the dream? Do you still want the thing that you thought you wanted? And I think it's also closely related to like, how do you know when it's time to bail on a project? Oh, right? yeah, that's I think there's people that are doing that. And I'm curious your take. Those two things are a little different, but I do think they're related. And how do you think about when it's time to sort of either give up on that dream or, you know, not give up on it, but you no longer want it. And when it's time to go, you know what, this project isn't quite right. It's time to move on. How do you, how do you approach making that decision? That's such a great question. And I think that for one thing, sometimes you just, if the decision is made for you and you don't want to admit it, you've got nothing mm-hmm. left for this project. You're not doing it. And the only thing you're doing in it is wishing that you were doing it. If mm-hmm. all you're doing on a project is wishing that you were doing this project or manifesting this dream, if that's all that's happening with it, you're not doing it. It's not, it's not, you have given it up. You just haven't admitted that you've given it up. That is, that is such a great, that's such a great point. And you see that all the time. All the time. Right. So here you are, you're standing, you're on this plateau because you can't move. And here's mm-hmm. the whole mountain that you think you should be walking up, should be climbing it, but you're not. And here's this mountain that you really want to climb up, but you can't because you're all you just turned over here looking at this mountain that you're supposed to climb up. If you could just turn around and look at really where the energy, it goes back to energetics, mm-hmm. like where it's partly a feeling thing and not a mind thing. Like, where is the desire? Where is the curiosity? Where is the energy? And if you go to that, it's sometimes much easier to, um, to if you have something you are doing, it doesn't matter what you're not doing. Yeah, no, I love that. And I would say for me personally, you know, I, I think that, yeah, to succeed at anything requires hard work. But I think that there's this narrative out there that is, oh, it needs to be grueling. And it actually shouldn't be that hard. Like, so I, I remember there was a time when I wanted to be a screenwriter and I was writing screenplays and I really had to force myself to stick my ass in the chair and write the screenplay. And it was not easy. And, but not only, not only was it not easy to do, it was, I really had to kind of force myself to do it. Whereas at the same time, I was blogging and doing internet stuff. And that was, I had to pull myself away from it. And at a certain point, I was like, it shouldn't be this hard. Like the truth is, yeah, I could probably figure this out and I can probably write a good screenplay at some point. But this other thing I'm just drawn to, it's not hard for me to find time to do it. The other one, I have to force myself to do it. To your point, this decision's already been made. I I, I just haven't embraced it. And, you know, it brings us right back to why me, you know, why yeah. me? Because you're so good at it. You're natural at it. And it's uniquely yours. You know, it's, yeah. you know, it's uniquely yours. That's a, it, those are great examples. Cool. And I think, yeah, but I do think people kind of underestimate how hard you have to work even when you want to do it. So, yeah. yeah. But I think the difference is when you really want to do it, you enjoy the work. If the time goes. Even when it's hard. Right. It's like, and I think that's another thing that I say to people all the time is like, you know, do stuff where you fall in love with the work, not just the potential outcome or result. I think for me with screenwriting, Mm -hmm. I love the idea of being a screenwriter more than I love the actual screenwriting. Yeah. I also say, you know, stop thinking about the Oscar and start thinking about the days at your desk, you know? (laughs) Because that's what it is, right? I mean, yeah. that's the that's the choice. Or you get when you get the Oscars, more days at your desk. Or if you're an yeah. actor, you know, more time sitting on the set waiting to, you know, waiting. Uh, yeah. What is the worst part of what you what your job is that you think you want? And can you do you know what don't look mm-hmm. at like the big reward. Look at mm-hmm. the grueling work, the gr- so called grueling work. Yeah. Do you have a stomach for that? Yeah, that's great. Great advice. Cool. So let me get to my last question for you. You built Uncabaret from scratch into a legendary comedy brand and community and all of this. So I want to know what advice you have for people who want to build something similar around their creative work or community, not necessarily comedy related, but someone that wants to 
build a brand around what they do, something that has some meaning in the world, wants to attract people, wants to attract a tribe. Where where do they start? What is it? What does it take? Why do you think it worked for you? What have you sort of learned in the process of doing that? Well, some of the things that we've already talked about, you know, love mm -hmm. the question. I really had a question, which was I didn't like the way stand up was happening in the world as it was. And I have this idea there has to be a better way. And what is it? But the persistent asking of that question so that when I was in the moment of I did this sh one show and as a comedian, you kind of know how funny things are. And this one audience was laughing a little harder than I thought really I was warranted. <laughs> and in the meet and greet afterwards, I was like, it wasn't quite as funny as you thought it was. I mean, when was the last time you laughed? And they were like, we never laugh. We're women and we're artists and we're lesbians. And we go to a <laughs> comedy club, they just make fun of us. And I was like, well, I'll make you a show when I get back from tour and it'll be unhomophobic, unxenophobic, unmisogynist. It'll be on cabaret. I don't know where it came from, Josh, but there yeah. it was because I had been asking the question persistently. The moment happened. And that's a, a thing of like following the green lights, you know, bringing yeah. in what we were saying, because they were so excited and I did it and it went well and they closed. And so I moved it. The, a lot of green lights kept happening. And, um, and community started forming. Other performers were interested in this idea. So they were bringing their friends. There was a certain amount of that. There was also resistance. Um, mm -hmm. Who does she think she is? And why does she get to say? And, you know, well, that's impossible. You can't do comedy like that. I mean, I definitely heard all that. Yeah. But at the same time, I tried to you know, turn a little bit of a blind eye to that and just really look at there's energy, there are people coming, but persistence is the other thing. So to say with the idea, when you get a light bulb, don't turn it off. I would mm -hmm. advice. If you have like a light bulb moment, stick with it a bit, at least, you know, because it didn't like become this amazing thing immediately. They lost their funding. I moved it. That went well. They had to move. You know, finally, when we landed at Luna Park, it was still hard to get people to come, even though comedians wanted to do it. The audience mm -hmm. was there. And I would invite even my own friends. And they go, ah, eh, stand up. I don't really like stand up. Yeah, sure. Because it sucks in comedy. <laughs> Right. You know, like we've, this is different. It's different. But then slowly people started coming and then there was a good press really, you know, then we got this giant piece of press. It, it partly has to do with continuing to weigh, like, am I being too patient? We're not patient enough. Is there energy, but it's not quite manifested? Is there no energy? So I would say community, love the questions, look for connection or people in the community. Are you able to draw people to it without pushing too hard? And, but are you also willing to work hard and roll up your sleeves on it? I'd say give yourself deadlines to make sure you're persistently putting it out. I mean, that has really changed my life was that we did it every week for mm -hmm. just decades. I did a show every Sunday. I mean, it took two Sundays off a year. Now we're doing one monthly show and one Zoom show. And, you know, I'm going to say this also, listen, you know, listen, this is something we've talked about throughout this conversation. You know, listen to what people are asking you. Listen to what the audience is saying. Listen, I mean, Uncabaret was built in my listening, really, because I listened to the other performers doing material, and I started asking them questions that changed the format. I listened to the audience because they were bringing their friends coming back next week. I was like, ooh, we really do need new material every That became important. So listening is so important to building a community or a brand you because it, what is a brand it's all a conversation josh the mm -hmm. whole thing is a conversation and if that i could leave people with that it's who are you talking to if you want to elevate your work elevate the conversations in your life you talk to the invisible talk to a higher higher people to talk to if the people in your life and if people are bringing you down in conversation and ruining your energy be really clear you are the person who has to respect your environment and elevate it so i would say that how did you one of the things that i think is really interesting and i think applicable to lots of people with all sorts of stuff especially people that are trying to kind of do something different. So one of the things that I think is interesting in the early days for you is you're putting on a stand-up show, but it's not 
like what people think stand up shows are, right? So like you had, you mentioned that you get people that are like, "Hey, I'm not really into stand up," and you're trying to go, "But no, 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 but this isn't that stand up, right?" So I'm curious, how do you sort of redefine or communicate to people, especially maybe before the obviously ideally they come see it and they go, "Oh, this is different." But in the very beginning, you have to sort of go, I'm putting on a stand-up show, but it's not like a stand-up show. And yeah. so I think for other people, it's like, I'm writing a blog, but it's not really like a blog. I have a YouTube channel, but it's not really like a YouTube channel. Yeah. I have a newsletter, but it's not really like a newsletter. How do you help define a thing that is actually different from people's expectations of what that thing is? I think somehow in the name, somehow in all your branding materials seem different. Mm -hmm. The way you talk about it. I remember we our first our first little motto was good entertainment for a nasty world. Mm -hmm. well, context is everything. We took it out of the comedy clubs. It turned into a nightclub where there was music and it was in the middle of West Hollywood. Context yep. is really important. So if you can recontextualize it, that might mean making it look different on YouTube. It might mean, you know, what, I have a YouTube channel that's different than a YouTube channel, so I'm going to put it on Vimeo. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. you can put it somewhere different. Context really changes. David Byrne wrote this great essay at the beginning of the CBGB book about how the shape of the room changed the music. And, Interesting. You know, that's a big thing to think about. Yeah, and, all the, and it's funny because I talk about this all the time with brand in general. Like, every little thing is branding. Yeah. Right? So on my newsletter sign up page where there's, you know, you know, subscribe here and there's a little form and typically below it, it says something about like, you know, whatever the generic, like we respect your privacy, we won't send yeah. you spam or whatever. And I think I changed mine to something like, you know, I'll never share your email address with anyone because I'm not a jerk. And that little, because I'm not a jerk. I have had multiple people say they subscribed solely because of that. Well, that's right? so great. I mean, sometimes I feel like I need to take a week and go through everything. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> but there's all these little touch points. And I think to yeah. your point, right? Uncabaret, if it's in a comedy club from the very beginning, it's going to make it a lot harder for you to send the message that this is not like a typical stand up show. Yeah. And then at another point, you know, about, um, in 2018, before the anniversary show, we did do Night at the Laugh Factory and we were invited. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it's interesting at this point to do one show, yeah. you know, at a comp just to say, you know, we also do our stand up. Right. You know, right. That, that also is like the, you know, you have to kind of keep pressing refresh, you know, right. Pressing refresh. And well, what's interesting is where the brand is 20 or 25 years into it or whatever that was is very, the messaging that you want to send is very different because well, now you're almost going counter to like, yeah, we're not just this like offbeat yeah, thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, we're looking at it. I, I mean, just totally that. I mean, at a certain point, I took a little hiatus when I came back. I was like, I'm, I'm, I need to like go out and see people and, and like find who's new that I don't even know. And they're, mm -hmm. you really have to stay current with like, why now? Like, why is on Cabrera yeah. relevant now? So relevance is a word that is really important to me. And it's what I, you know, I talk to people when we talk about why me, why now? Like, why is it important now for everybody else? I mean, besides, so is it burning in you and is it relevant to the rest of the world? That's the sweet spot, you know, if you can, if you can ever find that, like never let it go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a moving target. So once you find it, don't think you're done because you, you're going to have to refine it. Well, but can I just say, I yeah. feel like branding wise, Uncabaret was the greatest title that said so much, but also an albatross because it was so un. And I'm actually mm -hmm. sort of a pretty positive person. And it seemed, right. you know, well, sometimes, you know, I'm so negative for a positive person. Yes. Oh, <laughs> medium, But, you know, I feel like I fought against it, but that's okay to have a little friction also. You know, every well, and also, like you said, I mean, and again, we could probably talk for another three hours about the did. comedy world, but like, you know, the world is always shifting, right? So when you started out, alt comedy was not even really a thing. And then at a certain point, alt comedy is basically mainstream. Yeah. And so now what does it mean? <laughs> what, what? We're not even that. We're not that. We're just on cabaret. We're right. Not, we just really are 
its own thing. And it's so gratifying to see that, you know, new faith. I mean, you know, all these years later, you know, new people are coming for me in a way. It's all it's I, I want to say I am still looking for ways to innovate in it. I'm trying to figure out how to stream the live show. We did the Zoom shows two weeks after lockdown. We were on Zoom wow. and because innovation is part of the brand. Um, it's been important for me to find ways and I really want to be streaming the live shows now and I'm trying to figure out how. So, you know, and finding new people and new voices and stay fresh. But I also understand it occupies a different place in my own life than it did 25 years mm -hmm. ago. For me, it's like it will always exist. It's not the magic carpet I'm going to ride out on necessarily, but I I feel like I, you know, I did a thing that was very important to me. And, yeah, you, yeah, you certainly did. It is, it is quite an accomplishment. Right. Um, thank you so much for coming on. This was amazing and awesome. And I'm thank sure everyone's so going to find it. Before I leave, valuable. can I invite your listeners? You know, I'm doing a workshop. Yeah, please do. So tell yeah. people all the ways that they can tap into your genius and where they can follow you and all that other stuff. So fire okay. away. Well, there's the book. So you need to decide which everyone, you know, download it. People have told me it was so nice. I had tech on one of the pod podcasts I did in India saying that, oh, my God, this book is so helpful. All the people who are so famous are so vulnerable in it and share so much and that it was there's all sorts of bob odenkirk is in it and um, phoebe bridgers and dana gold and all sorts of your favorite comedians so that's available for your audiobook listening everywhere doing my a, a workshop called pick your next project that really is about helping people decide what to do next and applying some of these things josh and i spoke about today letting me actually help you. And it's a boot camp weekend. Bring in all your questions, even if you know your project, if you don't know the boundaries of it, you don't know the total parameters, you're lost, you have a million ideas. You know, I like to think that I'm my, my, the teaching wing of my business is called the infinite creator. So we're really working on, you know, taking your piles of paper, turning it into projects, taking your projects and getting them out into the world, that infinite loop. And you grow at the same time. And of course, uncapped shows. And I'm working with people over the course of a year now. Those those things, those are the best ways to, I'm on all the social socials and you're going to leave, I'm going to leave you a link and reach out and we can do Yeah, we'll put links to all this stuff in the, yeah. uh, in the show notes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. As far as me, if you like this podcast, please rate and review it on whatever platform you're listening to. If you share it on Twitter and tell people to check it out, tag me at Jay Spector. I will retweet you so you'll get in front of my 25,000 followers. My newsletter for theinterested.com slash subscribe. I host a series of workshops called Skill Sessions. You can check those out at joshspector.com slash sessions. If you want to talk about hiring me for coaching consulting, go to joshspector.com slash consulting. If you would like to be a guest on this podcast and come on and ask me some questions, go to joshspector.com slash questions and you can submit them. If you have three interesting questions, you'll get on the show. And if you don't, you won't. No, no, no pressure. And that's about it. Thank you for your interest. I will see you next week. Thanks again, Beth. This was Thank great. You.